just lift your hands and do that right now. Why don't you just exalt him? Hallelujah. Sing Thank your song you, unto him. Yes. Your song may not be like my song, but you sing your song unto him. You know, over the years, I have, I pick up some of these old songs and I learn them, okay? And I found that I have learned the wrong words to the songs. <laughs> and I'm listening to this song and I have been butchering everything but I exalt thee for 10 years. <laughs> I think it says, I'll sing my song unto thee. Is that right? Sing my song for you, yeah. Sing my song for you. <laughs> And I thought on the way here, Levi has now realized that me and his mother have much different taste in music. And I have realized my song unto God does not sound anything like my wife's song. <laughs> That's hard. My song has a really heavy bass in the background and a nice <laughs> drum track. And it's not a whole lot of singing unto God. But our songs are a little different. It's all right. Just like our praise is a little different too. I can't jump as high as Brother Nehemiah anymore. I can still beat him in basketball, but just not jump as high. Uh, my, my, my hands don't get as spread as high as some of these tall folks. Um, uh, sometimes my voice just doesn't resonate the same as others. But I've learned that if you can just do what the psalmist said. All right. Bless the Lord, yes. oh my soul. Hallelujah. If you can just sing and bless the Lord with your song yeah. and everything that you have in your way, that's when the exalting begins to take place. Thank you, Lord. It's that. Thank Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. If you turn with me to John chapter number 20, uh, we are having some wonderful technical difficulties with the no, we are not. It's, it's you up. might get Thank preached to now. They said, I got to use the paper Bible. And I thought, we are not about to have church now. But God is good yeah. all the Jesus. time. Yes. John chapter number 20, verse number 15. There's a pep there now. Jesus saith unto her, woman, all you guys that's not married, do not talk to your wife that way. Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Saith unto him, Sir, if thou have not borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Verse 16. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Yeah. She turned herself, who called my name, uh -huh. and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. Don't touch me. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. And say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. With the help of the Lord today and an awesome media person in the back. I want to preach this thought to you straight out of Magdala. Straight out of Magdala. Why don't you lift your hands in the building? Don't think of straight out of Compton, but to Magdala. God, you are so good. You are so great. You have been awesome. I desire that you would bless us today. You would touch us. Move in this building. God, that you would touch and help. In Jesus' name we pray. You can be seated across the house. We're going to go ahead and shut this. It was, a, um, it was a difficult day. It was hot, it was sweaty, and the crowds were enormous. A matter of fact, the crowds on the street had begun to form. Capernaum had become a place of celebration. This place was a bustling suburban city. People were surrounding one man just as they had done prior to the other stops that he had. Folks from all other regions, when they had seen this man, they had done just what Capernaum was doing. They pressed him 
and they came close to this man to just touch him because they've heard that those with sickness and plague, those with issues of infirmity in their body, if they could just touch him, there would be a healing to their plagues. This man had such authority that when he walked by, devils would even yell out and fall before him. He had become quite a skeptical in the region, and his work became well known. It. He currently was on the move to see the daughter of one Jarius and to touch her at the plea of her father because she was unto death. But something happened along the way. There was a woman. She had had a problem for 12 years. The scripture calls it an issue of blood. She had been deemed ceremonially unclean by her community. She was ostracized and she was outcast. She had spent all of her money trying to get a fix. She had seen all the doctors on the north side of India. She had seen all the doctors in Greenwood down to Columbus. She even saw the sketchy ones on the east side, and she knew there wasn't no help on the west side. <laughs> east side for life. Well, she had decided, I, I, I've got to do whatever I can to get a fix. I got a second mortgage on my house. I went down to the payday loan place to get an extra change. She was taking personal loan after personal loan. She was an enemy of Dave Ramsey. She had cashed out everything she could do just to fix her problem. And after 12 years, she was broke, and she was scared, and she was hopeless. But she had heard, just like others, that there was this one, Jesus. This man who was walking through her city. And she had committed to herself, if I could just touch him, I could be made whole. Better yet, the scripture says if she could just touch his clothes, not even in front of him, but if I could just touch his clothes, if I could just get a little touch from the back. So she pressed. There was a crowd that had formed. Jesus, he ran around with an entourage that makes rappers ashamed. He had come deep with his disciples and then walked down the streets of Capernaum. And he's already been put on assignment by Jarius. The crowds were pressing. Everybody that had a need, all of the broken people that had problems, they were all under the same agenda. If I could just touch him. But this one woman in particular, she decided if I could just get through the press, if I could get through this mangled group of people, if I could just get to him, I don't need to get in front of him. I don't need to be the only thing that he sees. I just need to touch him. I think sometimes in the church we need to recognize that God isn't in the business of giving handouts. You don't always have to be full in front of him and, and, and begging for something. But if you can just touch him as he's moving in the room, things can happen. And this woman, she commits this. I am going to touch him. And she presses through. She gets through the crowd and she reaches to the back and she touches Jesus. And her affirmity that she had had for 12 years is gone straight away. And in that moment that the healing took place, Jesus stopped. And he asked, who touched me? Can I tell some folks in here, if you would get sincere enough about touching Jesus, you can put him on notice. We might have 40 some odd people in this room. All of us have needs. Because people that got it figured out, they don't come to church. They play golf on Sundays. But the people that need something from God, they press together and try to get as close to them as possible. But if you could commit in this place that I need to touch Jesus today, 
you will put God on notice. He will stop and he will have a personal interaction with you that can change your life forever. Forever. Jesus said, who touched me? And, and, and he tells his disciples and they said, look at the crowd. Who touched you? Everybody touched you. You can't walk on this street without getting touched by 10 people. Who touched you? You know, this theory and this thought of if I could just touch him, it was an impact or a thought that spread through the region. And Mark chapter number 6, we're talking just two or one chapter later, the thing that this one woman had done had spread like wildfire. The scripture says, and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, it don't matter where you from, if you're from the ghetto, if you're from the suburbs, he'll go wherever. They laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch him if it were but the border of his garment and as many as touched him were made whole. Can I tell you that if we as a group of people could get this mindset, that if we can just touch the throne of heaven, whenever we get the chance, it would spread like wildfire in our community. Because there were some folks uh, in the New Testament, in, chapter, in Mark chapter number 6, they got this idea that something happens when I touch Jesus. Something happens when we get a hold of God, there's a song that's been popular. There is something that happens when I call that name. Oh, somebody, it's just when you decide in yourself that I'm going to get a hold of Jesus for me today. There is power in one touch from God. More work can be done in a 10-second conversation with God than an hour therapy session. There is more blessing that can come in a sincere touch from God than there can come in a 45-minute counseling session with me. I said a touch from Jesus can do some real work. And if anyone knew about the impact of a touch in the New Testament, it was Mary of Magdala, better known as Mary Magdalene. Her story is remarkable. In Luke chapter 8, we get a, a little snippet. In 8 and 2, we see this Mary Magdalene. The scripture says, A certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. If anybody knows about a touch from God, it's somebody that's had some devils thrown out of them. It's a broken person. If there's anybody that knows about a touch from God, it's one that's seen evil and wickedness work in their lives sevenfold. And we see that this woman, this Mary of Magdala, she allowed her problems to overwhelm her and to overtake her. She didn't just have one problem. I know folks, they just got one problem. I got friends, they got one problem. I got friends that they ain't good with money, and they always find themselves begging for rent. I got friends that they got problems because they can't leave women alone. But this woman, it said that she had seven devils. She wasn't doing nothing right in her life. Her problems had overtaken her. They had overcome her. She was a broken person that allowed her problems to overwhelm her and mess everything up. You know, sometimes in, for us when we read scripture, and this happens, whew, when we read scripture sometimes, we look at these stories and we think, we'll never find ourselves in a situation like that. You know, I read in, I've been reading in Mark a lot. Mark is my favorite account of the gospel because it's quick. We get into miracles, chapter 3. We read it. And that's what I want. I want to hear about miracles and cool stuff happening. But sometimes, for us, we don't think about the guy in Mark chapter 5 who's before the woman with the issue of blood. 
we don't think I could never have 2,000 devils. I'm looking at this room full of people. You're like, my life can't never get that bad. I'm telling this story about Mary, and, and she had seven devils. I'm looking around you, and I know I got some people. Uh, we ain't live, are we? We live? I won't name drop. But I got some special folks that I'm related to by in-law that I know they got a devil. But they ain't got seven of them. We've seen broke people. We've seen messed up people. I know what a, I know what an addict looks like. I know what some ugly attitude looks like. I know what arrogance looks like. I know what some sketchy businessmen look like. But when we read some of these stories in the scripture, we think, it can't never get that bad. I ain't never seen somebody with leprosy. It, that stuff just sounds outlandish. But that's the attack from the enemy, right? Because he wants you to think your situation is actually better than what it is. And that's how a woman like Mary can dwell with seven devils for so long. It's because she's in a place called Magdala, where there were corners all around the sea where there were women that found themselves in tough spots. It had become a common place for the devil to run rampant in a region. And it was easy to become comfortable with that kind of lifestyle and that kind of situation. And I want folks in this room to understand it is the attack and the work of the adversary to let you be comfortable in your sin and in your problem. I could say it some other way. Let's do this. The devil wants you to think it's okay to have a dirty search history and come to church and pray on Sunday. The devil wants you to think it's okay to have that terrible problem that nobody knows about that you take care of during the week. But you come to church and you still look the same. He wants you to be comfortable in your flaws. He wants you to be so comfortable in the things that you're not doing good, your sins, that after a while, it's not just one problem. It's not just two problems, but you look like Mary, where you've got seven devils in your life, and you look around to everybody else, and they're in the same situation. It is the work of the devil to stack sin in your life, to stack problems in your life so much that you're comfortable and you think it's normal. But if I could stand before a congregation today and say this, you do not have to sin every day. You do not have to be stuck in your problems and, and try to hopefully wait for an awesome evangelistic service where you can repent. But grace is a daily thing that can operate in your life. His mercy is accessible, not when you're at the church, but in any moment of your life. I can say that touching of the garment of God is not just for the church service. It's not just for when the ministers grab the oil. If you can just get it in your mind that I can touch God on my own. And the devil, he can't stop you from overcoming the issue. It's powerful. And we find that this Mary, when Jesus had an interaction with her, the devils got cast out, and she was thankful for it, so she followed him. Anybody in here have a testimony that God did something for you, and that's why you live for him? Hey, I say it all the time. I was telling some of the young folks the other day. My pastor, I got into the church. This is not 2024 ministry, but he told me, he said, son... It's either Jesus or six baby mamas. You pick it. And I thought, well, I would never pay that child support. So I met as well get on team Jesus. And I picked one. I got one baby mama. No, got a wife. But I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to recognize that before Jesus I had this, but because of him I am now this. And this room is full of people that have a story. It may not be seven devils cast out, but it may be a, an addiction that was lost at an apostolic altar. It may be a mental health issue that was healed at an altar. It may be a cancer diagnosis that went out the window when anointed oil came. It, 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 may, it may be that I'm a first generation person and, and no one in my family loves this gospel, but I found peace in the church house and I am on solid foundation today. I don't know what your story is, but I know you're at church on Sunday, and it's because you got a touch from God. 
I know, I, I know that you may not have it all figured out, but you can still remember that time when Jesus came on the scene for you. You can still remember it. I know there's some folks in the room. I don't walk like I used to walk because he made a difference. I don't talk like I used to talk because he made a difference. I don't live like I used to live because he made a difference. Oh, somebody, what a change he made in my life. I'm not compromising wrong for the right because he made a change. Hey, somebody, ain't you glad that I'm not what I used to be? Ain't you glad that I'm not that guy I used to be, but I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, I said all things, have become new. Ain't you glad about it? Hallelujah. And we could pull into our text. Mary Magdalene, she is a character that the book of John, the gospel of John, he loves to highlight little things that Mary does. Commentators and, and preachers for years have tried to really narrow down what Mary's story is. It's difficult, though. But we know she had a past. It wasn't always rosy. But there was something awesome about Mary. As after Jesus, the same man that had touched her, that had helped that woman with the issue of blood, that same man, that same Jesus, he went to the cross, he was nailed to the cross, and he gave up the ghost. They found him, they pulled him off the cross, they put him in a tomb. We know the scripture says in three days he's going to rise up. And this Mary and some other women, after the crucifixion of Jesus, they were going to that same tomb. Back and forth, back and forth. And there is this one particular day. And this is the one in which I'm pulling my text from, that this Mary, she is on her way up to the grave in the morning. She gets up so early. She's like all you old guys. She gets up in the morning when it's still dark to get her business done with the master. Um, I would implore anybody, um, a strong relationship with God comes when you set aside time when nobody else knows. That's where a real relationship comes. Um, I have figured this out, and a lot of this is learning from older guys in here, which is great. If I get up super early and pray, I'm probably a little too loud for my family. Sometimes if everybody goes to bed and I pray, I'm way too loud for my family. And then secondarily, I just don't like getting up early. But it's important to set aside time. Uh, a moment, uh, not just a moment, a, a, a good amount of time to have conversation with him, to grow a relationship with him. I know all you young people, you know what a, a good relationship with a boyfriend's like. It's texting him all day long. A good relationship with your master, it requires some communication all day long. Hey, half the songs that are coming out are Jesus is my boyfriend songs anyways. Y'all should be ready for salvation. I, you, I can go for a minute. I mean, you better come to church with some reverence every now and then. You just, all right. You got to understand, when you come before God, he is bigger than you. He is holy. He is all powerful. He is all things. If you sing songs that only compare and talk about God's love all the time, he is nothing more than your spiritual boyfriend. And when I mean your spiritual boyfriend, I mean he just does what you want him to do for you. He, he buys your lunch. He gives you what you need in the moment. You only talk to him when you want something. Or if you're bored, then you're like, oh, maybe I'll listen to a worship song. That's Jesus as your boyfriend. But you got to recognize that if you want Jesus to operate in your life, he got to be more than just a boyfriend that gives you what you want. He's got to be somebody that you call on and recognize what he can really do. Jesus is all powerful in all situations. He's not just my God when I'm broke. He's my God in my prosperity. He's not just my God when I'm in need, but he's God all the time whether I need him or not. 
He's not just God when I understand what he's doing, but he's God when I question and when I doubt and when I'm uncertain. He's not just God when everything is rosy, but when I'm scared and I'm afraid. He knows where I'm at, and he's got direction. I feel the Holy Ghost. I wish some folks in here would recognize that no matter the circumstance in your life, God is still on the throne. He's still the same God whether my life is terrible or it's good. He's the same God whether my marriage is rocky or whether we are a pedestal couple goal. God is still God. And he deserves your praise no matter what he does for you. If I get a diagnosis tomorrow that's not good, he is still God. And I'm shouting the same on the streets of gold. And if you can't celebrate how great he is now, when you get to heaven, you'll be real uncomfortable because there will be shouting on the hills of glory. I said there'll be shouting on the hills of glory. There'll be streets of gold that I'm walking, and I'm not going to be walking with a limp, but I'm going to be two-stepping because I see my Savior face to face. And when I get to the gate, nobody's got to let me in because his light and his presence. Is it okay to preach about heaven in the apostolic church? Is it okay to still talk about the gates of pearl and the walls of Jasper? And better yet, my Savior, who I'll see face to face. The scripture says, for now we look through a glass darkly, but then a face to face. This is just a harness of our inheritance. You ever see Holy Ghost filled services where they shout and we begin to praise? That is just an earnest. That's a small portion of what heaven's going to look like. Because if you don't like shouting, you might as well not like heaven. If you don't like celebrating, you might not like it. Because heaven is going to sound something like this. It's going to be a lot of hallelujahs. It's going to be a lot of praises. It's going to be a lot of dancing. It's going to be a lot of celebrating. So you might just get used to praising him now because your touch now will be an overwhelming feeling when you get to heaven. It's not just a touch then. It's not just a blessing then. But it's a daily glorified of a creator who's brought me. Somebody ought to rejoice because one day we're not going to be here, but we're going up yonder. Oh, somebody, I'm going up yonder. Woo! Hey, hey, soon and very soon we're going to see our king. There'll be no more crying there. There'll be no more dying, no more sickness, no more pain. Woo! Woo! Hey, 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 Brother Lanny, you won't be feeling like you do when you go to heaven. They got that glorified body waiting for you, and that victory is there too. I said there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more hurt, no more shame, because when you get to heaven, we all going to be the same. We going to be shouting. Come on, rejoice. Rejoice. Somebody. Oh, somebody. Somebody. Oh, somebody. Why don't you just rejoice right now? Hey. 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 Whoa. Whoa. Some fast. Somebody fast. Woo. Yes. Yes. Come on, somebody. Hey. Hey. Oh, somebody. Hey, I'm not living. All the pain you feel now, all the hurts you feel now, all the struggle you got now, it's not for naught. But somebody, if you can just hold on, the race is not to the swift. It's not just to the strong. It's not to the mighty with muscles, but it's to them that endureth to the end. And I'm saying somebody, the destination that we've got, the vacation spot at the end. Woo! Woo! I just, I'm waiting on it. Come on. Hey, somebody in the building, you ought to think if it feels good right now, if it feels good right now, wait until you get there with the saints and we begin to sing his praise. We begin to shout him. We begin to. Hey! 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 Come on with it. 
church, let's get a little bit of heaven in the building. Let's get a little taste of his glory in the building. Just can't stop praising. 